Well, perhaps at some point you've had a day where you got to the end of it and you had the opportunity to look back on the last several hours that had passed by. And all that you could say at the end of that day, as you recalled, all that had happened was, wow, what a day. I genuinely hope that you've had a day like that recently in your life, but whether or not you have or, or maybe you haven't in a while, after all that I anticipate is going to take place in our day together this day, I think that many of us are going to look back on today and say, wow, what a day. Today we get to worship the Lord in spirit and truth as one united body. After our worship service this morning, we're going to go downstairs. We're going to enjoy a a whole lot of good food, Thanksgiving feast that you guys have put together. We're going to enjoy the fellowship that God has given us through Christ. After all that's done, we're going to have the opportunity to hear about some of the things the Lord has done over the last year. We're going to make some decisions for the upcoming year to try and be good stewards of all the resources that the Lord has entrusted to us. And we're even going to have the opportunity to bring in some new membership some new members into uh, our church this afternoon. So, my friends, that's, that's a full and a wonderful day, and I, I hope it fires you up for the next several hours. But as full and as wonderful as I anticipate this day is going to be for many of us, it's only a small taste of what the apostles must have felt as they came to the end of this full and wonderful day that we're going to read about in Acts chapter 2 over the next two Sunday mornings. So if you have your Bible with you, I want to invite you to go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one there in the pews in front of you. Acts chapter 2, it's in the New Testament, the back half of your Bible. It's the fifth book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then the book of Acts. We're going to read the first 13 verses, but I'm going to pray before we do that. Father, we ask this morning that you would, by the power of your spirit, open our hearts to receive and understand your word. Lord, however you would have it to, however you would have to apply it to our lives, we ask, Lord, that our hearts would be softened to that and ready to respond in faith, to respond with action, to be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word as we go from this place. And we pray, Lord, that you would do that in us for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Acts chapter 2, the first 13 verses. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said, they are filled with new wine. Here in these opening 13 verses, here's what we see, and if you're taking notes, you'll want to write this down as your one sentence summary for the passage. I made it a little bit shorter this week, so you actually might have a realistic chance of writing it all down before I move on. So here's what we see in our passage this morning. We see the Holy Spirit came as promised 
to empower the apostles for gospel proclamation. The Holy Spirit came, as promised, to empower the apostles for gospel proclamation. I saw my wife got that down the first time. Luke starts in verse 1. He addresses the question of when this took place. And there's two pieces of information that he provides to us as the readers. First, Luke tells us that what he's about to describe happened during the Feast of Pentecost. Now, Pentecost was an important date on the Jewish calendar. And in fact, in some ways, you might even think this reminds you in some ways of our Thanksgiving holiday that's on our calendar. Pentecost was one of three feasts on the Jewish calendar, which every Israelite male was required to observe in Jerusalem. And so that means that this particular feast, there was a lot of traveling that took place, kind of like our Thanksgiving holiday, in order to to celebrate this feast that was on the calendar. Furthermore, Pentecost actually was a Thanksgiving feast. It marked the end of the grain harvest, and therefore, it was a time for the Jewish people who were scattered all over the world to gather together in Jerusalem to give thanks to the Lord for his faithfulness to provide for their needs. Now, Pentecost, some of you may know, this is a word that means 50th. The feast was called Pentecost because it took place on the 50th day after the Feast of First Fruits. So I don't want to lose you here. I want to give you a little bit of an explanation. I think this is significant, and so I want you to keep track with me. But like I said, Pentecost took place 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. Now, the Feast of First Fruits was a feast that took place during Passover week, on the day after the Passover Sabbath, Sunday. As the name of the feast suggests, the Feast of First Fruits was a time to commemorate the first fruits of the grain harvest. And so what would happen was the people of God would offer up the first fruits of the harvest to the Lord by faith. They wouldn't touch the first fruits of the harvest. They would give those to the Lord by faith, trusting that the Lord would be faithful to bring about a fruitful harvest in the land. The Feast of Pentecost that then happened 50 days after that was the culmination of that first fruits feast, meaning that Pentecost was a feast in which the faithfulness of the Lord to bring about the harvest was acknowledged and celebrated. Now, why does that matter? Well, if you remember, Jesus was crucified during Passover week on the day before the Sabbath, becoming our Passover lamb, as the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. And on the third day, that is, on the day after the Passover Sabbath, the day when the fir- Feast of First Fruits was commemorated, on that day, Jesus rose from the dead. Listen, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That's what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. And so you see, all along, these old covenant feasts that the people of Israel were commanded by God to keep, these these feasts that you and I might just easily pass over as we're reading through our Old Testament, all these feasts were pointing forward to Jesus and to what he would accomplish. The Passover feast, pointing forward to the death of Jesus on the cross as our Passover lamb, The substitute whose blood was spilled to spare God's chosen people from certain judgment. The first fruits feast, pointing forward to the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus being the first among many who would rise from the dead as part of a great harvest that the Lord promised he would bring about. And so how fitting it is that it's here at the Feast of Pentecost that the Lord's faithfulness to his promises would be seen and acknowledged. How appropriate for the Lord to choose this day 
when his faithfulness to provide for all of the needs of his people was already being acknowledged and celebrated by all Israel who had traveled into the city of Jerusalem from every corner of the earth to which they had been dispersed over the years. The Lord could have appointed any day for this global message to be declared, and yet he chooses this day, this feast, when all Israel had gathered together to celebrate his faithfulness, to powerfully demonstrate it to them in a far greater way. What a glorious God. What a wise God. What a loving God we serve. There's a second piece of information that Luke gives us with regard to the timing of this event, not just that it happened when the day of Pentecost arrived, but you see at the end of verse 1 that it happened when they were all together in one place. Now there's some debate about who's included in the word they. Certainly the 12 apostles were there, there's no dispute about that, but many presume that along with the apostles, the women and Mary and Jesus' brothers were there as well. Some have argued that the entirety of the 120 who were present for Peter's sermon in chapter 1 were still present with the apostles for this event. My own position is is that it was just the apostles who were together at the beginning of chapter 2. There's four quick reasons that I would give. Number one, the, the promise of this event that Jesus gave us that's recorded up in chapter 1 verse 5 was given explicitly to the apostles. Reason number two has to do with basic grammar rules. So I'm going to take you back to English class. The 12 apostles were the last group mentioned at the end of chapter 1. You see the last verse there, verse 26 of chapter 1. It says, the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. And so basic grammar rules dictate that when you come to chapter 2, verse 1, and you read they were all together in one place, the they, the most natural understanding of that is that it's the 12 apostles. Reason 3, in chapter 2, verse 7, the crowds refer to those whom they are hearing as Galileans, the very same way that the angels referred to the 11 apostles. Remember as they were standing there and gazing into heaven, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into heaven? And finally, we see in the text that when Peter preached to the crowds in chapter 2, we're told that he was standing with the eleven. When Peter was done, the crowds called out to who? To Peter and to the rest of the apostles. There's no mention at this point of any others who were there. So for those reasons, I think we're standing on solid ground with the understanding that this was just the 12 apostles who were present on this particular occasion. Now, with that said, I want to move us from the question of when the Spirit came in verse 1 to the question of how the Spirit came in verses 2 and 3. Notice with me the familiar way in which the Spirit came. First, we're told that there was a sound associated with the Spirit's coming. Luke describes this sound that came down from heaven like a mighty rushing wind that filled the house in which they were sitting. Now there's nothing new about the Spirit of God descending from heaven and being associated with wind. The Spirit is repeatedly associated, in fact, in the scriptures with wind or breath. In fact, if you go to Ezekiel chapter 1, the prophet Ezekiel wrote about a mighty wind that he experienced just before the Spirit of God came upon him and entered into him. So certainly, you and I understand God can do whatever he wants to do. The Spirit of God could have come upon the apostles without any sound at all if he had preferred to do so. But by coming in this familiar and unmistakable way, it serves as an assurance, or it served as an assurance to the apostles. It serves as an assurance to us that this was the fulfillment of what Jesus had promised in Acts chapter 1, just a few days earlier when he told them that the Spirit would come upon them. And so when the wind comes rushing down from heaven, the apostles would have thought, oh, here he comes. This is the Spirit. This is what Jesus told us about. Why did Jesus tell them the Spirit would come upon them in chapter 1, verse 8? We told them the Spirit would come upon them in order to empower them to be his witnesses, starting in Jerusalem and to the ends of the earth. Now, according to John Calvin, might have heard of him before, this is the reason why we hear that the Spirit was visibly displayed to them like tongues of fire before resting upon them. 
Now again, this wasn't new. Some of you will be familiar with the baptism of Jesus. Do you remember when John the Baptist baptized Jesus and he said that he saw the Spirit descend upon Jesus like a dove and remain on him? Well, in his, cap- in his commentary, Calvin wrote this. He said, the Spirit was said to have descended like a dove on Jesus because the dove was agreeable to the office and the nature of Jesus in his public ministry. The dove presumably identifies Jesus as the pure and innocent one who came to bring peace between God and men. Here in our passage this morning, we have the Spirit visibly displayed in a way that was agreeable with the nature and the office of these 12 apostles, displayed as tongues of fire to these men who had been commissioned to bear witness to Jesus with a message that had the power to stir the conscience and to purify souls. So to this point, Hopefully I've answered two questions. We've considered when this happened. We've considered how it happened in verses 2 and 3. Now I want to consider with you what happened in verses 4 through 13. And there's three things that happened in the text. First thing that we see is that the commissioned were supernaturally empowered. The commissioned were supernaturally empowered. We see this initially in verse 4, but then it's repeated and expanded upon down in verses 6 and 11, how this filling of the Holy Spirit that the apostles experienced supernaturally empowered them to carry out their calling from the Lord. I want you to notice, first of all, that they were emboldened by the Spirit. Verse 4 tells us that having been filled with the Spirit, they began to speak. If you take your eyes down to verse 6, you understand they weren't just speaking amongst one another, but they were speaking publicly apparently in the streets of Jerusalem loud enough that a crowd began to gather around them and loud enough according to verse 11 that they were able to be clearly heard they were declaring this at the top of their lungs this was a powerful work of transformation that the spirit had brought about in those who just a few days earlier a few weeks earlier I should say were unwilling to stand and say much of anything as Jesus was marching to Calvary I want you to notice also that the apostles were equipped by the Spirit. Verse 4 tells us that it was the Spirit who gave them the words to speak, even supernaturally giving them the temporary ability to speak in other tongues on this particular occasion, which verse 6 and verse 11 explain was the ability to speak in a variety of foreign languages that were recognized and represented on the day of Pentecost. What was the Spirit saying through the apostles? Well, verse 11 tells us that the mighty works of God were being declared. No doubt their words were focused on the person and work of Jesus, focused on the creator of the universe who took on human flesh, focused on the one who demonstrated his divinity through his perfect life and through his many miracles, focused on the one who, uh, who demonstrated Uh, or I'm sorry, who died on the cross and rose three days later in fulfillment of the prophetic word, focused on the one who presented himself alive to many witnesses before ascending to the right hand of the Father. No doubt Jesus was the focus of their initial declaration, just as we'll see in Peter's sermon next week. After all, these men had been commissioned to bear witness about Jesus. Why would we think they were doing anything differently? We see them doing so in a variety of different languages, this temporary reversal of Babel that the Holy Spirit brought about, and a reminder of the Holy Spirit's ability to empower God's people to accomplish God's purposes in far greater ways than we could ever ask or imagine. Brothers and sisters, that's what the Holy Spirit does. It's what he continues to do today. He supernaturally empowers God's people to bear witness about God's King for God's glory. But in saying that, I have to tell you that there seems to be quite a bit of confusion about that in our day. And it reminds me, in a lot of ways, of when our our kids were younger. We used to read a series of books to them. You might be familiar with the Us Born series of books. I called them the That's Not My Books. Because the title of the books was always something like That's Not My Puppy or That's Not My Teddy or something along those lines. And on the cover of the book, you'd have, for example, a picture of a puppy. 
And this puppy would have certain characteristics. Maybe the puppy had long hair and big ears and, and a short tail. But when you flip to the first page of the book, when you turn past that front cover, something about that puppy would be different. The, the pu puppy would have a long tail instead of a short tail, or it would have small ears instead of big ears. And, and the child was encouraged to shout out, that's not my puppy. And you'd do that page after page, that's not my puppy, that's not my puppy, until you got to the last page of the book in which the puppy was just like what you saw at the beginning of the book. And when you reach that final page and the, the child recognized that the puppy was the same as what they saw at the beginning, the child would shout out with great glee, that's my puppy. I feel like someone could write that book about the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Maybe page one could have a picture of someone supposedly being slain in the Spirit. And the words underneath it, that's not the Holy Spirit. Page two could be a prosperity preacher preaching health and wealth in this life to all who would just have enough faith in Jesus. The words underneath it, that's not the Holy Spirit. Many more pages could follow after that, I'm sure, but maybe on the last page, maybe it could, maybe it could have a person faithfully bearing witness about, uh, to Jesus as Lord through their sacrificial service as they're enduring some trial. Maybe boldly proclaiming the truth of the gospel in the face of persecution. The words written underneath it, that's the Holy Spirit. Friends, the Holy Spirit empowers God's people. He doesn't debilitate them. He empowers them not to obtain earthly comforts in this life, he empowers them to declare God's mighty works to the nations so that some might have the opportunity to enjoy eternal life. In fact, if you're here this morning and you're a Christian, then like the apostles, the Holy Spirit has empowered you for that purpose. Now sure, he, he probably hasn't given you and probably won't give you the ability to suddenly speak a foreign language that you've never known. That was a special gift at a special time. But the Bible does promise that the Holy Spirit has given something to each and every believer that he or she is instructed and intended to use for the advance of God's mission. I want you to listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote beginning in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 7. He said, to each is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Now, I get it. We can talk about cessationism and continuationism. We can have that battle. That's not for this time. There's a number of other ways the Holy Spirit equips God's people. Romans 12 mentions things like the gift of teaching, the gift of leadership, the gift of giving. But brothers and sisters, Paul said to each is given a manifestation of the Spirit. Peter said the same thing in 1 Peter 4 verse 10 to each, he said, is given a gift. In other words, if you're in Christ, the Spirit has equipped you in some way. Not in the same way he equipped the apostles at Pentecost, maybe not in the same way that he equipped the person sitting next to you or behind you, but make no mistake, if the Holy Spirit indwells you, then the Bible says that he has also equipped you. So yes, it's important to be able to recognize what is not the power of the Holy Spirit so that we and those around us are not duped and led astray. But it's equally important to remember that because the Holy Spirit lives in every single believer, every single believer has been empowered by him to contribute something valuable to the ministry of the local church and the advance of the gospel. If you're struggling to know what that might be, I'd encourage you to come and find me, Pastor Andrew. We'd be happy to talk with you about that. But know that you have a role in this body if you're a member of this church. Know that you have a role in the spread of the gospel. You have a purpose. You say, yeah, even me? I'm past my prime. 
I'm not as knowledgeable. I don't have the degree that that person does. I don't care. The Spirit says to each has been given a manifestation of the Spirit to give glory to God and to build up the body of Christ for the mission of Christ. Take confidence in that. Believe that this morning. Know that God wants to use you in some way to build up this body so that we might carry the gospel to the nations. Returning to the text, we see how the Spirit's supernatural empowering of the apostles led to something else that happened, a second thing, that as a result of the apostles being supernaturally empowered, the crowds were seriously perplexed. Verse 5 informs us that during this time in Jerusalem, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven. And when these men came together and they heard the apostles speaking in their native language, verse 6 tells us that their response to all of this was bewilderment. In verse 7, Luke says that they were amazed and astonished. They began asking questions and saying to one another, "Are are are not these Galileans? How is this possible? How is it that we hear each of them in our own native language? All these different regions and language groups represented, you see them listed there. Yet we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. So at least at this point in the chapter, we see that the focus of the crowd was on trying to wrap their minds around how these Galilean men were speaking in all these different languages. Again, in verse 12, we read that they were amazed and perplexed, leading them to ask yet another question, saying, what does this mean? It's a great question for them to ask. Something unusual was going on, and many in the crowd wanted to hear an explanation for it. Next week, we're going to hear Peter give an explanation. But before we get there, we see a third thing that happened in verse 13. We've seen the commission supernaturally empowered. We've seen the crowd seriously perplexed. In verse 13, we see the scoffers swiftly emerged. Amid the perplexity of the crowds, we're told that some of those who gathered began to mock the apostles, saying they were filled with new wine. Now, that's an attempt to offer an explanation for what was going on, but it's a pretty ridiculous one, right? Being filled with wine causes people to do all kinds of things. One of the things that it certainly does not do is suddenly enable people to be able to speak in a variety of foreign languages that they've never learned fluently. But even in our day, when someone's run out of answers, when someone's run out of replies, when someone's run out of excuses, how often do we see people try to cover over their ignorance through name-calling, derision, and all sorts of other things. So within the crowd, you see how these two groups emerged as the apostles declared the mighty works of God, as this work of transformation was demonstrated before them. The first group you see is the inquisitive. These were those who were asking questions, legitimately desiring to know what was going on here. What was this all about? What is this work of transformation that's taking place that nobody can explain? But then there's a second group, the scoffers, who were only interested in ridiculing and maligning the apostles. I want to tell you this holiday season, it's where we are now. Halloween has passed us. We are now in the Thanksgiving, Christmas holiday season. Don't allow yourself to be sidelined by the scoffers. Some of us too easily believe that the lack of interest or the ridicule from those that we share the gospel with means that we've done something wrong. That in the future it would be better if we just remain silent about the whole gospel situation. But here we see the apostles, listen, speaking the exact words that the Holy Spirit gave them to speak in languages that they had obviously never learned this powerful demonstration of the spirit of God present with them to devout Jews who knew their Bibles and Old Testaments probably better than some of us in this room. These guys were serious about honoring the Lord and despite all of those things that would lead you to expect at least an inquisitive response. 
Still, there were some among the crowds who scoffed at the apostles and who accused them of being nothing more than drunken fools. We all know about the scoffers. We've all experienced them. If we've ever shared the gospel before, I guarantee you've come across them before. But don't forget about the other group that's mentioned in this text. Don't forget about the inquisitive group in this text that asks three questions and desire to know more. That group exists in our day as well. The reality, though, is that you won't come across any of those people if you allow yourself to be sidelined by the scoffers. And so I want to challenge you over the next couple of weeks, particularly the Thanksgiving holiday upon us, go and ask the unbelievers around you what they're thankful for. When they turn around and they ask you what you're thankful for, be bold and tell them about your Savior. Tell them why you're thankful for Him. Ask them if they share your gratitude. Ask people what they're doing for Christmas. When they turn around and ask you what you're doing, tell them you're going to be at church on Christmas Eve, remembering the gift of the Savior who was born to die for the forgiveness of your sins. Maybe ask them if they have a church that they'll be attending that morning and see if they might want to come along with you. Sure, there's going to be scoffers. There's going to be some who are not going to be interested at all. The apostles had to deal with them. We should expect to encounter them in our day as well, but don't allow yourself to be sidelined by them. There are too many. There are too many who still need to hear that they're really not a good person. In fact, they've fallen short of God's perfect standard. There are too many who still need to hear what you and I and and the rest of humanity deserves for falling short of God's glorious standard. And it's not heaven. There are too many who need to hear that. Too many who need to hear about the mighty work of God that was planned from eternity past to send his son Jesus into the world to take that punishment and that judgment that we deserve upon himself and to give us peace with God. Too many who still need to be called from their sins to turn and trust in Jesus by faith alone to receive forgiveness and the hope of eternal life. There's too many. You can't be sidelined by the scoffers. Brothers and sisters, those are fiery words. The gospel is a fiery message, is it not? When it's appropriately declared by the Lord's faithful witnesses, it puts the heat on the conscience of the unbeliever to recognize as they look in the mirror of God's law that they are not indeed fit for heaven. But listen, it is also a message A fiery message that has the power to purify souls for all who respond in repentance and faith. So be bold. Be bold to share those words over the next few weeks. Don't be surprised by the scoffers. But keep your ears open for the inquisitive. When you find them, because they're out there, Invest your time in them. Invest your efforts in them. Invite them to church. And pray, pray that God's Spirit would mightily work through you and the rest of God's people so that when they hear that message, when they come to this place, when they see God's people gathered together in the power of the Spirit, they look in this place and they go, what is that about? That's not normal. Why is it that an a 90-year-old saint is sitting next to a, a 12-year-old boy. Why, how, what is it that gathers a Congolese family with a bunch of Kentuckians and Texans and people who are really good at tech and people that really know nothing about tech, men and women, boys and girls, black and white? What is it about this group that they love each other, people from, from great financial means and people that really have nothing to their name? What is it that brings them together and worship? to sing like this, to love one another, to care for one another. What does that mean? Pray that God's Spirit would show them that and demonstrate that power to them through our works, our service to one another, and through our faithful declaration of the gospel that comes from this pulpit and through your faithful witness. Would you pray with me? Ask that God would do that this holiday season, that he would save sinners from every tribe, tongue, and nation, maybe even some in this community, that they would come here and they would turn to Christ by faith. Father, we thank you 
for the power of the Spirit who is in us, who equips us, who emboldens us. Thank you for the promise that like the apostles, we have been given gifts by the Spirit to accomplish that mission, to be empowered for that mission, to declare your mighty works. Lord, that's what the nations need to hear. They need to hear the mighty works of God. They need to hear the gospel proclaimed. And so we pray, Lord, that you would give us boldness, that you would give us words to speak, that we would do so faithfully, courageously, and that as we do, your spirit would go before us, preparing the hearts and minds of those who we speak to, that they might ask questions like, what does this mean? How am I saved? What must I do as we're going to hear Peter be asked next week? We pray those questions would come our way, and we pray, Lord, that we would have the answer, an answer that gives the nations hope, an answer that declares that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. Lord, that you would soften hearts to respond in repentance and faith to that message, to turn from their sins, to turn from the things of this world, and to turn to Jesus, who's coming again soon. It's in his name we pray. Amen.